Welcome to Tangents, a podcast from Coin Center. This week, your host is Naraj, and I'm joined by Jerry Brito and Peter Van Valkenburg, my colleagues. Uh, rather than bringing on a guest from outside, I figured that it would be a good move to have them come on and talk through some of the recent developments in the policy world for cryptocurrency. So thanks for coming, guys. Hey, Naraj, thanks for having us. <laughs> this is a real uh, inconvenience. Yeah, uh, it was. They were very available for me, thankfully. Uh, so the thing that I think is at the top of everyone's mind, and something that we commented on and participated in, was this FinCEN rulemaking. So uh, in short, there was a notice of proposed rulemaking that would uh, kind of increase the AML obligations of financial institutions and make it a little bit tighter, and. Um, I thought that maybe a good way to start this would be to actually have Jerry or Peter, or both of you, just explain kind of literally what is a this, this rulemaking process and how it works. Peter, you want to go? Well, maybe you'd be better to explain the rulemaking process. Oh, well, <clears throat> how far Not back like do we go? Maybe, maybe we should start with the Constitution. <laughs> so, okay. Well, just, uh, yeah, no, no. literally, what is the notice of proposed rulemaking? You know, is it... Uh, yeah. So look, why don't I explain rulemaking? Peter explains uh, the travel rule, and then maybe I can talk about cost benefit. Yeah. So, um, look, um, Congress will often pass a law, but then give the um, uh, the agency that administers the law latitude in how it implements that law, right? Because it, <clears throat> the Congress. You know, we've come to the conclusion that Congress can't um, write every single little detail, right? And so, um, but yet we want to have democratic or some kind of public uh, input into when the agencies go ahead and, and develop what essentially becomes law. Um, you want to have some kind of democratic input into that lawmaking. And so what we have is rulemaking. So whenever... So, you know, in the case of the travel rule, it creates an obligation on the part of banks and financial institutions like crypto exchanges um, to have to do certain things when trans when they basically are part of transactions uh, over a certain threshold. And so when FinCEN goes to set that threshold, they have to go through a process where they seek comment from the public. And um, that's sort of how we have some kind of democratic input into the lawmaking. And the way it works is they have to go through this process where first <clears throat> they submit uh, their proposed rule to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs at OMB, where they basically check it that the rule um, uh, is cost beneficial, and then it gets published in the Federal Register. And that's where anybody, um, uh, anybody in the public is allowed to uh, submit a comment. And the way it works is it's not about, you're not voting, right? So it's not like if we can get, um, you know, 100,000 comments to say this rule is bad, that then the rule doesn't pass or something like that. It's not democratic. The, <clears throat> what comments are meant to do is to advise the agency, hey, you haven't thought of this, or hey, um, maybe you should consider doing this as well, or hey, you know, you might want to consider amending the rule to be this other way, like giving them actual uh, constructive input. Um, and so once they go through that process, the rule becomes binding, um, uh, on, on the regulated parties. Yeah. And so in this particular case, it's, it's the travel rule that they're amending. Yeah. So I can explain the specific rule making. I will add just as like a tangent for audience members to go research if they're interested, if the administrative rulemaking process sounds weird and like yeah. a pretty lousy, um, substitute for democracy there's a vibrant literature you know of, of folks who believe that to be the case and think that we've sort of abdicated our democratic institutions in favor of executive branch fiat and the rulemaking process is just this sort of fig leaf for that unconstrained power there's a really good book by um professor hamburger philip hamburger Philip Hamburger, yeah. Called it, Is Administrative Law Really Law? I think it's the actual title. So it was, it was check called legal, something like that. No, it's it's is it law? Is it really law, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's excellent. Um so can that's I just, tangent. We won't talk too much about that. But can, can I just add one more thing? Is yeah. is just, just to sort of um underscore what you're saying. Yeah, what we've done by creating the administrative state, and by administrative state, we mean 
um, basically all of these agencies that administer the law and create new law in, in administering that that um, that law, um, we've created a fourth branch of government that was never in a constitution. And so, as Peter says, as a result, we've created this fig leaf way of keeping it in check, which is called the Administrative Procedures Act. And that's where you find uh, all of the process. Um, and it's like a mini constitution underneath the real constitution. And so this this particular rulemaking is about a part of anti-money laundering law and policy that's referred to as the travel rule, uh, primarily. And some of you will already know a little bit about this because you've seen headlines maybe in Coindesk or other places about, ooh, it's difficult to think about how the travel rule might apply to a Bitcoin exchange or something like that. And so that that's come up time and time again. It's worth noting that this particular rulemaking isn't cryptocurrency specific at all, actually. This is just about the travel rule writ large, which is something that banks have to comply with, that PayPal and traditional money transmitters have to comply with. And yes, that coin oriented money transmitters like Coinbase uh, also have to comply with. And what the travel rule is, what all of these money services businesses and banks are complying with is this obligation to collect information about certain transactions of a certain size. Now, it used to be $3,000 or more is this threshold. Above $3,000, you have to collect this information. And then not only retain this information so that it, you have it in case law enforcement comes to you and says, hey, your customer is doing something suspicious. We'd like to know more about these transactions. So you have to retain the information um, in case law enforcement needs it in the future. You also actually need to bundle it up and send it in some hopefully secure manner to the receiving financial institution if you're initiating the transaction if you your customer is saying i want to pay someone at wells fargo and your bank of america you have to send the, the transaction information which includes like the name and the address and other pertinent information about the customer to wells fargo and you have to retain it if you're the receiving one um, so you've got it from bank of america you have to keep it uh, on file and this is also that ideally with respect to a certain subset of total transactions within the economy, $3,000 and up is what it's traditionally been in the US, there are good records on both sides of a financial transaction. And this applies to cryptocurrency only in so much, and this is an important point to always keep in mind, when somebody is acting on your behalf with respect to a cryptocurrency transaction. So if, if I hold my own keys and Naraj has his own keys and I send Naraj some Bitcoin using a self-hosted wallet, this is not part of the travel rule requirements because neither me nor Naraj, to the best of my knowledge, Naraj, though he leads a very exciting life, are financial institutions. We're just ordinary persons, so we're not subject to the law. But if I was using a Coinbase wallet and Naraj was using Kraken, um, those are both hosted wallets, that transaction technically is subject to the travel rule. And Coinbase needs to get the information on me if it's over $3,000 and Naraj needs to, Naraj's institution crack and needs to, to receive the information from me when this transaction takes place. And the trickiest part about this, and maybe we'll get into this later, is that often when I ask my hosted wallet provider to pay a Bitcoin address, they don't know if that Bitcoin address I'm paying is a self-hosted wallet, in which case the travel rule doesn't apply, or if it's another financial institution that's regulated like Kraken, in which case the travel rule does apply. So then to get to actually what this rulemaking is about, I know I've like sort of I, uh, papered the walls with like crazy, crazy details. To get to what the rulemaking is actually about, it's mostly about lowering that threshold for when the travel rule applies for a financial institution. Previously, as I said, and currently, it's transactions $3,000 and up. You need to collect information and send it to the receiving financial institution. This proposal says, well, why not $250 and up, which is pretty radical, frankly. So Europe has had a lower standard than the US for travel rule data sharing. Uh, it was 1,000. Um, and we were always expecting US regulators to have a rulemaking like this one to finally catch up with Europe and just have homogenous standards right around 1,000. And, and because and it's part of lowballed it, they went <clears throat> straight to 250. And then one little wrinkle that's worth mentioning, because I don't want to be disingenuous, is that it's 250 if the transaction is originating overseas or going overseas. Only the cross-border ones, like to a foreign financial institution, 
are at this new lower 250. Presumably, if it was two domestic financial institutions, it'd still be 3,000. So that's what this rule is mostly about. There's also some stuff about clarifying whether virtual currencies like Bitcoin are money for the purposes of um, the Bank Secrecy Act. They're not asking whether it should be. They're just proposing to define it more clearly because it's always actually been pretty clear that it would qualify as money. Um, but we can get into that later. Yeah, and the funny thing, um, and it's something that I'd be curious to ask um, our friends at Vincent um, about their reasoning, but so, you know, to give them their due, the reason to bring it down to 250 is because um, they say, you know, they explain and it makes perfect sense. Um, you're going to catch a lot more bad guys if you bring it down that low. Um, because there are a lot of transactions that they find um, that when they talk to law enforcement and or look at their data, a lot, maybe even a bulk of the transactions that are involved with um, illicit activity are below three thousand dollars, but above two fifty. Yeah. Um, uh, that claim, said, I think, the, the claim I think is that they're most worried about counterterrorism, right, as compared with money laundering and. Conceivably, and then their data suggests that, yeah. that that's where they should look. What's interesting, though, is in a way, we're kind of still expecting you mentioned that in Europe, there's sort of homogeneity around a thousand dollars. And that's part of Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's part of FATF's recommendation. Yeah, I think I think so. Sometimes I get the thresholds with SARS and travel rule confused momentarily. So forgive me, audience, if I've mixed those up, but I'm pretty sure it's one thousand for travel rule. Um, according to the fat of recommendations, which is the international body that sets recommendations. Right. So they've gone to, so, you know, and that's, and that's not just between countries, but also domestically within countries. And so it's interesting that the, that in this case, the U S has gone really below that to 250, but only between, uh, between countries, but not domestically. So the U S is still not, um, in sync with the fat of recommendations. Um, which is super interesting. Yeah, I just checked. I, I was right. It's a thousand. Good. I shouldn't have doubted myself. I should have just not not said anything and just looked cool on the podcast. So, right. um, <laughs> so we can talk about what we said in our comment, uh, Niraj, if you'd like. Yeah. Before that, um, yeah. there's a component of this that I think is of interest to people, which is the um, the way that the threshold has actually come down through by inflation over the last few decades. Um, do you recall, it was pretty high, it was almost $70,000 for a SAR. Was it, uh, and then, but now it's something like so, 10, Like, So specifically with the travel rule, this $3,000 requirement when the Bank Secrecy Act was new, was a $20,000 was was $20, of today's money in purchasing power. So you would have you would be subject to the travel rule in the 1970s when all of this was brand new if you were moving today's equivalent of twenty thousand dollars or more. At which point it's like, yeah, you're doing some heavy duty financial transactions that can be deeply consequential. Like people can do a lot with twenty thousand, thirty thousand, forty thousand dollars worth of value. Can you do a lot that's deeply consequential with just three thousand dollars, which is the was the nominal amount back then, and is the real amount uh, or was the real amount back? God, I always get confused with inflation. <laughs> you can do a lot with 3,000, but not nearly as much as you can do with 20,000 is what I'm saying. And so because of inflation, the requirement has effectively lowered year every year, year after year, year yeah. in the, because the real value of the dollar has decreased and decreased and decreased. And so if you think about our current proposed $250 threshold, if you, if you trans, translated that into 1970s dollars, it would be the equivalent of a uh, $40 threshold. So pass if, if Congress had done this in law with a democratic institution and voted on this, they would have been voting in the 1970s to have banks record and collect and make available to governments and other financial institutions every transaction you make over $40. That would have been what the law that they were passing back then if you, if you equalize things for inflation. Um, of course, Congress never made that law. They left it to the administration, and the administration chose three thousand back then, which was the equivalent in real dollars today of twenty thousand dollars. So probably much less controversial. And we've sort of we've had a lowering standard because of inflation, but we've also sort of eroded our own expectations of what's normal to the point where now a two hundred and fifty dollars threshold. Some people are probably like, yeah, well, if it stops terrorism, it's fine, right? 
and that's a debate to be had, but the counter argument to that is that's an incredibly large number of transactions that are now being subject to the travel rule as compared to ever before. And that's, and that goes to the, to the point that we have this fourth branch of government that <clears throat> really isn't checked by elected officials on, in any regular meaningful way, because, you know, as Peter's saying, um, when Congress passed the BSA, right, when members of Congress read it and voted on it, um, I wonder if you could time travel back there and ask them, what do you think you're voting on? Do you think you're voting on a law that's going to sweep up anybody who um, transmits 40 bucks or more? They're going to say, no, of course not. That's not what's going to happen. Right. We know that the executive is never going to bring it down to that exactly. ridiculously low level. So, but here we are. Right. And now you end up with uh, a fairly massive trove of these uh, SARS and travel rule uh, compliance documents that are then available for whatever nefarious purpose. Yeah. Well, it's it's not necessarily nefarious. It's just that you, you're creating honeypots. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> All of a sudden now, you, um, you know, if the tra if the um, requirement was three thousand or up, and now you're moving it down to two fifty, you're going to be now uh, as a financial institution on the hook for recording and for transmitting to people outside the country, because remember this, you know, is only between, um, uh, uh, you know, in transactions in and out of the country, um, transmitting this information to people whose um, security practices you don't control, right? And you have to trust them. You're, you're transmitting personal information about people. And yeah. you're doing that now for many, many more transactions um, than you were doing it uh, before. And so yeah. this just creates, um, as they, you know, security people say, a bigger, you know, um, surface area for attack. Um, so yeah, I mean, it could be nefarious, or you know, on the part of financial institutions or the government, but it doesn't have to be. It could just, it's just bad information yeah. security practices. Yeah. yeah. And Naraj, you keep mentioning SARS uh, suspicious activity reports, which is a whole nother set of surveillance obligations that banks have to do where they say, um, well, we're not doing a transaction to another financial institution right now, or we're doing one that's at a lower threshold, is below the 3,000 right now, but there's something suspicious about the transaction. Uh, when that's the case, and it's just sort of the financial institutions guess what should be suspicious and what isn't, and they're gonna probably think that a lot of things are suspicious so as to not disappoint their regulator. If they think a transaction is suspicious, they file a report that's called a SARS report to FinCEN. Um, directly. So it's not, this isn't information sharing between two financial institutions. This is, this transaction was suspicious. So I'm going to go straight to the regulator who's going to share this information with law enforcement. And that's a SARS report. And it's worth noting that, so that's another report where potentially banks are hemorrhaging or uh, amalgamating tons of personal information that's, that's vulnerable from a privacy standpoint. Um, and that is also a report that didn't exist in the original Bank Secrecy Act in the 1970s. The original Bank Secrecy Act did not include suspicious activity reporting. That was not added until the 1990s, and it wasn't really in wide practice until the Patriot Act made some additional changes to the Bank Secrecy Act in the 2000s. And so we went from a, from a, from a law that created no suspicious activity reporting requirements, and you might say, well, some suspicious activity should be reporting, to a law that now has millions of reports coming in in the in the 2000s and 2010s every year um massively more data collection all happening and we haven't mentioned this yet and we should have all happening without a warrant this data just ends up in the hands of government because the banks give it over without them even needing to ask for it so it is a bulk collection surveillance statute very much like what the nsa did with its prism program with email uh, from Google or from other third party uh, communications intermediaries. And everyone got really upset about the NSA revelations when Snowden revealed that there was a bunch of warrantless surveillance going on. But for some reason, people aren't that upset or they've just accepted or they don't even know that there's been tons of warrantless surveillance of your bank account records since the 1970s, increasingly more and more and more to the point now where it's just a, an absurd amount of data, quite frankly, through SARS and if we were to lower the travel rule threshold to 250 and sweep up all that data as well. Uh, it sounds like we're getting closer to, to the point about the trade-offs for society uh, that we made in our comment letter. So uh, I guess, could you go into that? Yeah. Um, 
So as part of, you know, the Administrative Procedure Act and the way that, that rulemaking happens, um, <clears throat> we employ something called cost-benefit analysis, right? And this is something that goes back to, um, like Richard Nixon, I think, may, might have begun to practice. And the idea was, you know, agencies, and so the Administrative Procedure Act goes back to the 40s, and agencies really taking on the lawmaking stretches back to the New Deal. And back then, um, there was really no check, right? Um, uh, you, you had the Administrative Procedure Act, but the agencies were just putting out rules, putting out laws, essentially, but putting out regulations or regulations um, that they needed to accomplish the thing that they wanted to do right? That they had the power to do that Congress gave them the power to do. Um, and after a while, um, it sort of became obvious that they were just putting burden upon burden upon burden on the public, right? On businesses, um, on you know people, et cetera, without any thought to, you know, well, what does that burden cost, right? They were just looking at, at the benefits. So here's what we want to accomplish. Here's the public good we want to do. Um, let's pass a reg. Um, without thinking, well, there's a cost to it, right? And so starting with Nixon and Ford, um, but then, um, and and Carter, they all sort of did this kind of informally, but starting with Reagan, uh, Reagan signed an executive order requiring that OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, specifically the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs there, um, that conduct a cost-benefit analysis where whenever there's a new reg proposed, the agency has to do an analysis where they say, here are all the benefits we're trying to get with this rule. Here's how we think we're going to we're going to get. But here are all the costs. Um, and this rule, the benefits outweigh the costs. So while there are some costs to it, the benefits outweigh. And um, so Ray, you had Reagan's executive order um, in under President Clinton. He had an executive order, twelve eight six six, that um, really spelled it out with discrete steps. And then President Obama reaffirmed that executive order, adding some new steps. And so I'll get to that. <clears throat> it basically says you have to identify what you want to accomplish. So step one, right? Step two, um, you need to figure out different regulatory alternatives, right? Different things you might, regulations, different versions of the regulation you might do. Then you have to do the cost benefit, you, you know, calculate the benefit, calculate the cost for each of those alternatives, and then figure out the one, if there's one where um, benefits outweigh the costs, what's the one that maximizes it and put it out there? That's basically all the Clinton executive order. And then the Obama executive order added um, a, a step where they said the agency should also consider um, hard to quantify um, costs and benefits, right? And these are things like the impact on human dignity and privacy, right? Um, and distributive effects, right? So how fair is it um so using that rubric and that's what agencies must do they must go through this process so using that rubric we look at um the uh notice of proposed rulemaking that was put out by finson and the federal reserve in this case about the travel rule and what we find is that they indeed did a cost benefit analysis and um you know looks fine um uh where they identified here's what we want to do right we want to catch more bad guys um, here's a way to do it. We lower the threshold to 250. That's an option. They also had some other options. They had lower it to zero. That was an option they considered. And lower it to, do you remember, Peter? There's, there was a, a, 250 was the medium one, right? There was like a zero, 250, and oh, a thousand or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said, no, 250 works well, because as I said, you, you, you know, um, we're concerned about terrorist financing, and there's a lot of transactions between 250 and this. Um, and then they say, the cost here is... There's going to be costs to financial institutions, but look, as a matter of fact, they're already collecting this data, right? So banks are already re you know, re recording all of this and they already do travel rule compliance. So they're just going to be adding a few more transactions. So it's not that costly to them. So it's cost beneficial. Well, what we point out in our comment letter is what the executive orders require of agencies is that they look at the cost benefit, is this regulation cost beneficial, not just to the regulated parties, right? Is it too costly for them? But it's, is it cost beneficial for society, right? Um, sure, maybe it's not very costly for the banks, but what about the rest of us, right? Completely missing from their analysis. And I can understand, you know, their laser focus on what they're laser focused on, which is catching bad guys and trying to get the people that they regulate to comply. 
Um, but they've, you know, completely missing from their analysis was the effects that this is going to have on the, I don't know, they, they don't have a number, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of Americans are going to be affected by this, missing completely. The word privacy does not appear once uh, in the uh, in the analysis. And something we don't, you know, we sort of, we sort of pointed out, but we don't spend too much time on. We were more focused on the privacy. Uh, but I hope somebody writes a comment about this. What about the distributive effects, right? So clearly this is going to raise the costs to people who, for example, maybe don't have identity uh, documents, maybe because um, they're undocumented, they're homeless, et cetera, right? What is that going to do, um, uh, you know, under the distributive considerations that the Obama executive order would put, put forward? So that's what we pointed out. And um, sort of related to that are some constitutional issues that we also pointed out that maybe uh, Peter wants to talk about. Yeah, so we raise lots of constitutional issues with respect to over-application of the Bank Secrecy Act in a long paper that I wrote and we published two years ago now called Decentralized Cash, um, or Decentralized Exchange, Electronic Cash, and the, and the Constitution. Uh, so I'll direct you to that if these are, these are interesting. But in this um, comment, in, so Jerry and I kind of jointly wrote it, and Jerry brings a lot of administrative law experience um, from his time at Mercatus and George Mason uh, University. I have done a lot of the constitutional research. So Jerry wrote this first section about the cost benefit analysis, which was great because it, it made it easy for us to say, look, you haven't even done the necessary homework to even begin this rulemaking process. You didn't measure all of the costs. And then when it came time for us to, to sort of hit home that the costs are fundamentally important, that privacy is a, a good and that things that chip away at privacy significantly and, and a $250 threshold would chip away significantly because it'd be a lot more private data going between financial institutions are very bad. Um, the first thing that came to mind was, well, you can make a few different arguments. You can do some sort of econometric uh, collection of, you know, like the, the costs of identity theft and things like that, the, the measurable costs of privacy violations. We've done that in past papers. It's it's convincing. Uh, one fun fact that we didn't mention in the comment is that identity theft is actually the most is the most costly economically um, of all theft. So you might think that like other other thefts like grand theft auto or whatever are more costly, but identity theft is actually the single most costly form of crime that people face in this country as far as theft. And by um, the way, can I just say the kind of econo econometric analysis that you would do to um, uh, account for what the costs might be, that's something that FinCEN should be doing. Yeah. Right? So yeah. we're just pointing out to them, you haven't done it. So we're not going to take the first stab at it. FinCEN should take the step, first stab exactly, at it. Exactly, exactly. So, so instead of taking the first stab at it or going too far down that road, I thought it would be useful to just cite some inspiring and important holdings from Supreme Court justices with respect to the Bank Secrecy Act and how it violates privacy. So we cite um, Justice Douglas and Justice Powell in their dissent and concurrence, respectively, uh, in the case, California Bankers Association versus Schultz, which was the Supreme Court case back in the 1970s, where the court found the Bank Secrecy Act constitutional as it was applied in the 1970s. Um, it's important because if you're not a constitutional law nerd, it's important to note that sometimes the Supreme Court finds a statute unconstitutional. It's just Congress wrote this, it is bad, it has to go. It violates fundamental rights like privacy or like speech or things like that. But sometimes the Supreme Court says, uh, right now this statute as applied by the administration is unconstitutional. So the administration has to go back and apply it differently, but the law itself might still be constitutional. And so in the Bank Secrecy Act case, the court with Powell as the concurring justice, the, the deciding vote in the case said, the Bank Secrecy Act gives the president and the administration a lot of power that's kind of questionable. But as they're applying that power right now, we think it's constitutional. And as we've been talking throughout this whole podcast, it's yeah, worth so, noting. Yeah, implicit in that is if that were to change, there is if the administration through its rulemaking were to make some massive change to the way that it, it it's applied right now in 1970 1971 so yeah. one uh if that were to change well we'd have to revisit whether it's constitutional whether or not. constitutional or not and and um 
So those de those deciding votes said, I'm only ruling as a justice. I'm only ruling based on how it's applied now. So this is, you know, not the first rulemaking we've seen to expand the scope of the BSA. This is just the most recent one and a particularly drastic one because it brings that threshold all the way down to 250 and sweeps up masses of more private data. So I think this constitutional argument that like, look, tread carefully in your cost benefit analysis here, because if what you uncover is that this really does jeopardize much more personal information, then what you're really uncovering is the potential unconstitutionality of the statute because it it simply creates too much of a warrantless surveillance regime. And the Fourth Amendment says that generally speaking, searches of personal information, seizures of personal information require a warrant with particularized suspicion where a judge can also say, yes, you get the warrant, you can search their house or no, you don't get the warrant. So there's a judicial check on the otherwise unbound authority of the executive to sort of rifle through your personal effects in your papers. Mm -hmm. And so I think the two, the two, the, the cost benefit analysis of the constitutional law analysis go hand in hand nicely. And there's even a little added wrinkle wherein the standard for when a warrant is required is when the information being sought by the government is something that the person has a reasonable expectation of privacy over. And that's a weird subjective standard that we got in a court case called Katz, also back in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and, you know, I think it's funny because I think already the Bank Secrecy Act might be kind of unconstitutional for this reason, is if you ask a normal person on the street, do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in all of your banking records, in all of your PayPal transactions, in all of your Bitcoin transactions? Do you expect privacy there? Is that a reasonable expectation? I think most people say, hell yeah, I expect privacy, at least some amount of privacy. And I think that's reasonable. But in California Bankers Association versus Schultz, which again is about the Bank Secrecy Act's data collection back in the 1970s, the court said, no, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy over these records because you're voluntarily handing them over to a bank, which is a third party, and you would expect that bank to share them with other people as they, as they see fit. And so you, you give it to a third party, you lose this expectation of privacy. And maybe the just the justices felt that way because it was a minimized amount of information about domestic transactions that was being shared. And you'd have a reasonable expectation that transactions over $20,000 through your bank could end up shared for the purposes of law enforcement or other things. But it's an interesting question. If we lower that threshold down to $250 or the real value $40 equivalent back in the 1970s, I think you should have a reasonable expectation in privacy for those low value transactions. That's like buying four books on Amazon. That's the kind of transaction that's highly relevant potentially to, you know, your 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 political um, prejudices, your 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 belief system and all the other kinds of things that we should have some right to privacy over because if we don't, you're just going to end up, you know, targeted or victimized or any number of other things for reading the wrong books. So, yeah. Peter Peter reads expensive books as well. <laughs> yeah. So no, a, Kindle, a, a normal Kindle book is like nine dollars. Yeah, you said I four. pirate them is what you're saying, but <laughs> uh, I'm curious if the even without this rulemaking, if the, um, the the fact that inflation has reduced the threshold by so much would be enough to retest it. I wonder if we'll ever find out. Uh, we need um, a litigant to challenge it. We okay, have, so if um, anyone who's <laughs> Anyone who's listening and is feeling feisty. Oh, I'm not saying we're not seeking one. I'm just saying there needs to be one. Okay. Um, so since we've gotten now more onto this issue of privacy and expectation of privacy from financial institutions, uh, it's actually kind of a nice segue to our next topic, uh, which has to do with the central bank digital currencies and uh, kind of the expectation of privacy being built into them. So readers of Jerry's newsletter, uh, Money and Power, subscribe today know that um, the Bank of International Settlements and a few central banks together put out a report which raised our eyebrows because they essentially treated the idea that uh, that uh, any central bank digital currency does not necessarily need to have privacy built into it or wouldn't have privacy built into it as a foregone conclusion uh, because of their sort of what they see as regulatory obligations. So Jerry took issue with that. Uh, Jerry, would you mind walking yeah. through that? <laughs> yeah, it'd be so interesting. Uh, What's that? 
take issue with it now. Yeah, it's just been a hobby horse of mine, just because I think it's it's just um, you know somebody on the internet said something wrong, uh, and I have to go right. Somebody at a central bank said something wrong. Um, so it's not just the Bank of International Settlement, right? This is something that I've seen in report after report, right? So all the banks now we're finally getting to the point where we're they're getting more serious. But for the past twelve to eighteen months, we've had every central bank basically since Libra and then China, <clears throat> um, every central bank has been looking, you know, studying the question of central bank digital currency. And in that process, they each bank has slowly churned out white papers where they discuss, you know, if we were to build one, what would it look like, right? And so you had uh, the Bank of England, the Bank of Canada, you had the Federal Reserve, um, and then most recently, you had the Bank of International Settlements put together a group of central banks, including the Bank of Japan, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, all together put out a big paper. And in each of these papers over the course of months, there's always a paragraph <laughs> or two that says, and of course, it can't be private. Of course, a central bank digital currency will have to comply with anti-money la laundering obligations. And of course, we'll have to collect information on all the users of, of the digital currency, of course. And it's just like, I want to flip over a table because it's like, why, of course, show your work, right? The one paper that um, actually hedged was the Federal Reserve paper, where they didn't say, um, of course, a digital dollar would have to um, be um, subject to, you know, is subject to anti-money laundering law. They say, um, we can't imagine that it wouldn't be. Okay, that's fair, but it, but I'll, I'll get to why that's also problematic. And so what's the problem? The problem is, is there is no law that um, requires that, so the, the Bank Secrecy Act that we've been talking to applies to banks and financial institutions. You know who it doesn't apply to? The Federal Reserve, right? The Federal Reserve is not bound by um, the Bank Secrecy Act. And how do we know that? Well, you can go into your wallet and pull out a dollar bill. And what is that? That is a completely anonymous um, instrument that's been issued by the Federal Reserve. Um, and they don't know that you have it or who you're trading it with, right? And they're not keeping any records of that. And that's perfectly legal. There's no law against that, right? And so when all these central banks say um, that, central, that central bank digital currencies, if they're ever issued, would have to... Um, comply with AML laws, I think they're, they're, they're kind of missing. Sure. To the extent that, um, you have a hosted wallet where you keep your digital dollars, um, maybe they will have to comply with AML law, just like a bank where you keep your paper, you deposit your paper dollars where they will have to comply with AML law. Um, but once you withdraw and, you know, if you, if you are able to have, um, uh, uh, sort of a, a, a self-hosted wallet with digital dollars on it, there's no reason why the Federal Reserve couldn't, if it chose to, allow you to just hold those and not, you know, not track you, um, give you the privacy, the same privacy that you, that, that you have now when you use paper currency. And as I say, the Federal Reserve doesn't say, um, yeah, it doesn't go as far as some other uh, central banks have gone and say that, you know, um, that it's not legal. They say that they um, just can't believe that that's going to happen. And here's the thing is that they're not Congress, right? Um, it, it, it's funny too, because they're still printing cash. Yes. I, I mean, I mean, the mint prints the cash, but the federal reserve orders it. Right. And yeah. so like, they're, they're still putting bearer instruments out into the world that get picked Brilliant. up by shows and, and mm -hmm. transacted with. So, why can we have that? Why is there no law against that? But oh, if you made it digital, suddenly it it's not allowed. It does that doesn't follow. Right, and it's and there are there's over a trillion dollars in circulation in paper currency. Um, so clearly it's possible, um, and not just that. They, the Federal Reserve and central banks around the world too, but the Federal Reserve um, is always making pronouncements about how they will never abandon cash. I want to reassure you that even if we're considering CBDC, 
cash is very important to us, which it is, by the way. Um, it's how they fund themselves. Uh, the Federal Reserve, that is. Um, so, you know, they care very much about cash, but then they say it's not possible here. Again, um, they are not Congress. All right. If Congress wants, first of all, I'm not sure they have the authority to issue a central bank digital currency without congressional um, authorization. And if that's the case, Congress can choose whether to um, have a digital currency as private or not. And in Congress, we've seen two um, bills, two, uh, we've seen two um, pieces of legislative text related to CBDC, right? One of them has the central bank digital currency be a token based and completely private. So clearly Congress is still thinking of, you know, hasn't made up its mind. Yeah, some members of Congress actually care pretty strongly about it being private. I wouldn't say it's necessarily a majority, but a majority probably don't even know what this issue is yet. But right. this is how the legislative process is supposed to work is civil libertarian members of Congress have certain ideas about the need for private transactions to have a free market and, 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 and personal privacy and, and a flourishing democracy. And then hawks that are more concerned, not to be mean, but hawks that are more concerned about terrorism, sometimes for the right reasons, say, no, we can't have it be private. And these are all elected people, not just randomly appointed people uh, who make these decisions. And it gets hashed out in a democratic fashion. Right. That's interesting, Jerry. I didn't know that. Um, I mean, I, I guess I, I, I didn't know that the the Federal Reserve and, and others are such staunch defenders of cash. Oh, because yeah. I, I haven't looked closely at this, and my presumption is that maybe, maybe they're not being, um, maybe they're not making a mistake. They're deliberately saying, "Oh, well, we could never do this," because they're kind of in a, in a backdoor fashion trying to to phase out cash to say, you know what, you know, we're going to do digital stuff now, and of course that can't be private, and this is a way to actually get rid of the one last remaining private. Um, bearer instrument transaction, a cash transaction, because you're replacing cash in a way with digital currencies that'll be surveilled because they won't be private. But yeah, I, I, so look, I can't speak to their motivations, right? I don't know if they're being cynical or not. I, I just generally have no idea, but um, yes, they are. Um, uh, they, they, they definitely protest a lot um, about, Cash. They're guilty to cash. And especially if you look at the UK, uh, the UK's report has a section on, you know, how they care about cash and they um, cite a separate annual annual or biannual paper that they do, which is a use of cash report where <clears throat> the purpose, as far as I can tell, the purpose of this paper where they do a consultation with the public is to just on a periodic basis, reassure people that cash is fine. Right. And so the constituencies um, around this, I take it are, unbanked type of concerns. It's the elderly. Um, uh, so there are definite, it's, it's different kinds of um, uh, uh, sort of industries in the US. You have a cotton industry, right? Um, there is, yeah, so- um, We don't have polymer bills yet, right? <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, there's uh, a strong, true. there's a strong impulse uh, among like kind of media coverage of Cast the society to remind people of the unbanked, of the elderly, that type of thing. Like that, that's a major concern, and I think that it doesn't appear to be going away anytime soon. Yeah, I, I don't think in in the U.S. it will. But the the other thing is, and this is um, in Ken Rogoff's um, book, uh, "The Curse of Cash," which is worth reading. Um, he wants to um, eliminate all large denomination bills. Um, uh, and it's it's a very interesting book. Like, um, like hundreds what? or like twenties, like what's large? He wants to start. I think he wants to go. Um, he wants to phase it in, but he basically, I think twenties, I think is the highest he wants to have. Hmm. Um, Isn't and there? He's like, look, you can still carry a million dollars in a suitcase with twenties. It's not like, right? I uh, found it difficult to fit them all in, but yes, yes, you can. Yeah, it's a big uh, anyhow. Um, but he points out that so uh, you know without. Uh, um, how do I put this? Uh, the, the Fed um, makes a lot of money <laughs> through seniorage, right? And we're not talking here about people think that that um, the government can fund itself through seniorage. That's not the case, but the Fed does, right? So they have a very parochial 
um, incentive there as well. All right. Uh, so a final topic for the day <laughs> is uh, something that a lot of people have been asking me about. In light of the PayPal news and now the Coinbase debit card news, it seems like there may be a renewed push for cryptocurrency to be used in day-to-day -day payments for small value type stuff. So naturally, um, that's it, the current state of things, very difficult thing to do tax-wise because every transaction is a capital gains event. So um, many people have asked me for an update on the de minimis exemption that we have been uh, advocating for. So I think uh, maybe if you could start by just reminding everyone what we are asking for and then where it is. Yeah. Um, so for those who don't know, the problem is that if you buy Bitcoin today for, you know, Thirteen thousand dollars, fourteen thousand um, dollars. Let's say you buy, <clears throat> I don't know, ten dollars worth of Bitcoin, and then a week from now it's gone up to twenty thousand, right? Um, and you buy a T-shirt with your Bitcoin. Well, you have experienced a capital gain, right? Because the price went up. You disposed of your Bitcoin in exchange for a T-shirt. And now you owe capital gains on that bit. And it's your obligation as a taxpayer to keep track of that capital gain, report it on your income tax and pay the capital gains on that. And so that's fine if you're an investor and you're buying and selling in big lots and you're keeping track of all that. But if you're talking about trying to have day-to-day -day payments where you're buying you know, Bitcoin once a week, when you get your paycheck, maybe you have an auto buy and then you're spending it throughout the day, you know, throughout the week as you're buying coffee, you're buying stickers, you have a subscription to a magazine, whatever. Uh, God forbid you're doing microtransactions where you're paying, you know, on a metered fashion. Um, that's not going to work because all of those transactions, you would have to record, report, and figure out the basis and, and pay capital gains. In. So technically, if you're doing those things today and you're not reporting it on your income tax, technically that's not in compliance. And um, that's just not feasible, right? And that's never gonna allow this technology to, to work. It's too much friction. Um, and so what we've done is we've worked with Representative Emmer, <clears throat> Representative Schweiker, Del Bene, and others. Um, to develop the Cryptocurrency Tax Fairness Act. And what it does is basically creates a de minimis exemption, just, just like there is for foreign currency exemption, for foreign currency, where as long as the transactions that you're doing are below $300, you, you don't have to worry about it, right? So if you're buying a t-shirt, you're buying a cup of coffee, you don't, you just don't owe any tax on any of those. Above the $300, which I know is not a lot, but it's parity with the foreign currency um, exemption. Above that, you do. But at least for those transactions below that, um, you don't. Know. And so where is that? Well, the bill's been intru um, uh, introduced in the House. Um, it's got bipartisan um, sponsors, which is very important. Um, the, the House, you know, originally this bill was first introduced by um, Representative Schweiker, who is on House Financial Services, um, or sorry, um, uh, House Ways and Means, which oversees the IRS and tax issues. Um, and it was introduced last Congress when the Republicans were in the majority. This year, we had the bill reintroduced by um, Representative Del Bene, who's a Democrat. They're in the majority. So you can see this bill has good bipartisan support within the Committee of Jurisdiction. This is all very important. Um, so uh, that's all been a lot of work. Um, unfortunately, as you may know, we have an election tomorrow. Um, or maybe when this comes out yeah, yesterday. I Yes, so it'll be ongoing uh, when this. So, so uh, you guys and who are listening to this in the future um, have a better sense of why this bill isn't moving. Um, <laughs> things, things just aren't moving in Congress, um, and things like this are just low priority, unfortunately, in Congress these days. Um, maybe once um, there is a new Congress um, in in January, um, we're going to have to work to get the bill reintroduced again. Um, and maybe once that happens, um, uh, uh, maybe we can see some movement in the next Congress. That said, I think it's important to do that work to get this bill introduced, even though 
you know, the chances of it passing are slim um, because it shows the IRS um, and, you know, that folks in Congress care about this, right? And that this is an issue. Um, query whether, con whether the IRS alone has the power to change this. Um, it might not, but it might have um, some flexibility in how it, it'll enforce it. To date, the enforcements we've seen out of the IRS have not been for, you know, lower transactions. Um, so we'll, we'll see, but it's, you know, it's kind of, it's important. It's high priority for us. Worth noting that when the IRS went to Coinbase asking for all their transaction records, their first ask was all their transaction records. Every Bitcoin transaction, we want records up to see if anyone's not paying taxes on those transactions. And Coinbase, you know, thankfully stood up and said, that's that's not an appropriate John Doe subpoena. We, we, we can't just give you records on every customer. That's millions of customers. Uh, and the court came back and set a threshold. What was it? Transactions over 20,000, right? Mm -hmm. I think it was so, it 10 or 20. I think I, it was 10. I can't remember. It's one of those. You can go find it. But so that I mean, was a good example of a judge putting in a reasonable lower threshold on this kind of thing. But it, it does also, it hadn't occurred to me until so we, start, we started talking about it, show that the IRS has an appetite for hoovering up all kinds of small value transactions. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't think they're going to use that kind of data in bad faith, but when you have just like a, a can of Coke purchase that technically has capital gains and you don't pay capital gains, you are non-compliant with the tax law, even though you neglected to pay a fraction of a, of a cent. And, you know, when the law makes illegal the activities of every American and it's up to the up to the person enforcing the law to choose which Americans to enforce against because you can pick amongst every American because every American is non-compliant. It's a really bad state of affairs. Um, if you believe in the rule of law and and sort of fairness and justice. So it'd be great if if <laughs> if we got the law changed so that I like I'm wearing socks right now. I'm not going to put my feet up in front of the camera that I bought using Bitcoin. And I didn't pay capital gains on that transaction. So oh, no, that. this is evidence. Yeah. Oh, God, we got to edit that out. Question of guilt. <laughs> uh, I'm sure everybody who's playing with DeFi right now is paying capital gains on their gas fees. Oh, that's the other thing I, we didn't mention. Yeah, so it's 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 probably going to be some time until we're all buying coffee uh, and socks and Diet Cokes with Bitcoin. Um, so you might think this is not that big a deal because there really isn't that big of a retail market that takes Bitcoin. But this applies to mining fees and gas fees, right? So if you're just sending it around and you're paying that, that technically you're buying something that's a disposition that's that's capital gain so it just makes it makes ethereum especially um you know the whole point of ethereum is that you can run decentralized apps on it and in doing that you're going to be spending ethereum and in doing that right now i mean we're talking like little bits of ethereum uh right now that's all subject to capital gains yeah, if you're playing like a, like a game on Ethereum that's just constant, constant microtransactions, you're that's going to yeah, be a mess. Keep track of all those and putting those into your uh, your tax submission. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're if you're doing that, donate to Coin Center because we're trying to fix it. I like the idea that like for me, like video games still come in boxes that I bought from CompUSA or whatever. But on the like box cover of the decentralized app game, it would be like now with built in capital gains compliance. And you'd be like, thanks, Maxis. I just wanted to play some city. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, this has turned into a very informative podcast. So thanks for thanks for coming on, guys. Thanks for, hey. for dropping everything and coming hey, on. Thanks so much for having us. It's been, a privilege. <laughs> it's been great, Niraj. Uh, yeah, so I will talk to you guys soon. And uh, thanks for listening.